the way people were identified, if you one lived in a village and one wasn't particularly famous or their parents weren't particularly famous, then it would be something like John the Baker or John the Smith or John the Traveller. It was a simple name because within the village, people would know then who you're talking about or John the Farmer uh, up, the, you know, up the way, up the road or next to the big tree. People could identify within the village then to whom you're speaking. If someone had some fame with, uh, between the villages, then their surname or the way they're identified would right be John of Sydney or John of the village or something that would then say that this particular man or if it was a woman, this particular woman was known amongst the village uh, or villages and so that was a name that would be known by a broader audience. If it was a famous name within the village, then it would be something like John the Younger or John the Son of such and such. So this is how people lived. People didn't have surnames. And if you go and look at your heraldry, some people had surnames. And if they did have surnames, it was because they were able to find that they were connected in some way to those noble families that uh, started to be registered and identified. Of course, there are older names, there are older titles, and, and in the case of the Collins, the Kulian, there is a very, very old title there, which the ruling authority would rather not have recognised, and in a sense, they don't formally recognise, but it is registered in heraldry as a, a, a name, but without any noble title. So when did surname come in? And what was the context of surname coming in? Because clearly this is very, very important. If the, if the meaning of surname is suri nomen, slave name, then clearly, clearly, when we use it without necessarily thinking how we use it, we are identifying ourselves as a slave. Literally, identifying ourselves as a slave. Well, it turns out that the word surname, the concept of surname, came into being at the beginning of the 19th century, 200 years ago. As early as 200 years ago was the first example of surname and the requirement of surname as uh, being legal name was 200 years ago. And guess what it was first used in? Napoleon Bonaparte in the Napoleonic Code, otherwise known as the First Civil Code of 1804, 21st of March 1804, is the origin of the first use of surname as a legal requirement in the completion of a legal name. Unbelievable. That is the first use of surname. And I'll give you three examples where surname was used. If you go and look at the civil code of Napoleon, and there's no evidence in the UK statutes prior to 1804. I've gone through them. There is no evidence of surname being a fundamental requirement. In fact, in the establishment of the registers of birth, deaths and marriages in 1837, indeed in the Wills Act of, of the same period, there is no evidence of surname being a requirement at that point. None. The first use was in the Civil Code of Napoleon Bonaparte. So if you look at Chapter 1, General Ordinance, Clause 34, it says, The records of the civil power shall declare the year, the day, and hour at which they shall be received. The Christian name, surname, age, profession, and domicile of all those who shall be therein mentioned. So there you go. And it's used in a number of other places. I'll just give you another example. Chapter 2 of Acts of Birth, Clause 57. The act of birth shall set forth the day, the hour, and the place of birth, the sex of the infant, and the Christian name, in capitals, Christian, which shall be given it, the Christian and surnames, profession and domicile of the parents 
and those of the witnesses. So not only do we see the introduction of the use of surname, but it is also a key part of identifying to whom these ordinances, to whom these new statutes apply when people are registered into a new concept of registers, the resurrecting of the slave registers. That's the origin of them. Well, moving on, let's move to our next word. Well, before we do that, let me just say how do we deal then with surname in the context of wills and testament? Well, there's a couple of ways we can deal with surname. The first is that we don't mention it at all. And you've probably heard me say in previous weeks that when one signs as a general executor and one generally never signs as a general executor and one, unless one is issuing a warrant or unless one is granting some form of a deed and right, certainly the general executor, other than that, never signs. But if one does sign as a general executor, then I would sign as Frank Anthony R. Full Stop. That is Frank or Francis Anthony R. Full Stop. And the reason I would use R. Full Stop is that R. Full Stop represents Regnum. And Regnum is used because if you are the general executor of your own estate, you are the sovereign of your own dominion. You are a head of state. You are a foreign head of state. And so you are a king or queen of your own domain. Hence, Frank Anthony R. Full Stop. So that's one way. Another way is to go Frank Anthony open square bracket O Collins close square bracket. That's another way of using the surname but knowing that in the brackets it has no legal effect. The other alternative I heard, which uh, is another way, is Frank Anthony colon double space and then O'Collins in all caps, which is the abbreviation of the estate. And what that means is Frank Anthony of the estate O'Collins. That's another way of presenting it. So there are some options in how to deal with surname, remembering that if you use surname, then you are admitting to being a slave. And it appears in their system that the use of surname and the reflex use of surname is a uh, essential identifier that you are under their jurisdiction and under their control. And the absence of surname, the deliberate absence of surname, appears to be a clear indication that you are not under their control. Let's move on to the next one. And let's see if we speak about citizen. In terms of citizen, if you go and look at the meaning of citizen, you find that uh, it says that a, a citizen is defined as a person that is legally recognized as a resident of a city or town, and that uh, it is originally from Roman times. Well, the word that the Romans used was not the word citizen. Romans didn't use the word citizen, and the word citizen is not a Latin word. The words that Romans used for citizenship were civis, C-I-V-I-S. That was the term the Romans used for a citizen of a Roman city, and municiceps, municiceps, that's M-U-N-I-C-E-P-S, was for a citizen of a province. There was a big difference. A provincial citizen had less rights than a city a citizen of Rome, but a citizen of Rome was a civis, and a citizen of a province was a municiceps. The Romans never used the word citizen. The word citizen didn't exist in the time of Rome. So why do all these books that we, lead, we, we read say that it was? Why do all these films talk about the word citizen? Why do, are we led to believe that the word citizen is some ancient Latin term from the time of the Caesars, when it's not. Who created it? 
when was it created and, and, and why was it created? Well, it turns out the word citizen doesn't come from Roman times. It certainly doesn't even come from the 14th century. It comes from, guess what? The 19th century, the same century that we see the estate being taken over by the corporation. In that century and in that time, we find that the word citizen is made up of three Latin words. Cito, meaning to set in motion, to call by name, to cite or summon. That's cito, C-I-T-O. The second word is is, even though it is deliberately misspelt now as I-Z. And is meaning he, she, it, this or that. So we have cito, we have is, and the last one is n, meaning come now. It's a command, n. So when we put those three together, cito, dropping off the O, is an N, cito, sen, we get to set in motion, to call by name, to cite or summon he, she or it to come now. It is a command given. So citizen is effectively one who agrees to be commanded ultimately. And who and what are a group of people that agreed to be commanded. Well, we could call them wards. We could call them indentured servants. We could call them apprentice laborers. Indeed, we'd call them slaves. And that is what a citizen is. Well, when did the word citizen first get used legally then? If this is the case, when did the word citizen first get used in print in statute? And it appears that it uh, was first used at the time of Napoleon in the Napoleonic Code, in the Civil Code of 1804. And here is just a few of the examples, just one example, as there are over 30 examples. Title I of the Enjoyment and Privation of, citizen, of Civil Rights. And we see that the definition there brings in the definition in Clause 7. The exercise of civil rights is independent of the quality of citizen, which is only acquired and preserved conformably to the constitutional law. So there we see in the same act that introduces the word slave name, the use of surname, we see that in the same time the word citizen is introduced. Now, before we continue, I just want to make a comment for those that are listening and those that are involved in the chat. Because one of the things that I'm asked and one of the things that people raise all the time is why go to the effort of doing this research? Or why go to the effort of doing this kind of background? And if one knows who one is, for example, if one knows scripture then is that not enough is that not enough why do we even bother in going down this detail that if one knows who they are is that not enough well as we have said over and over and over again if you do not know their presumptions if you do not know the basis of the law, if you simply mouth words in the belief that they will set you free without any competence, if you are not competent, then you will feed yourself to the lines. And anyone who approaches this with one-liners, with simplistic sweeping statements, needs to be held to account. Because the one thing that we've been doing with Eucadia and the one thing that has set us apart and now is setting apart most competent people who are promoting any kind of competent assistance to anybody is the concept of competence and knowledge. And no longer this sweeping belief and faith of blind ignorance. Now, there's still some people that hold out and there's still some people that still seek to promote blind ignorance and sweeping statements. 
who refuse to listen and read, who are 